possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. It's the All Ireland Hurling semi final preview show. So, Rory O'Neill and myself are joined by Derek McGrath and Brendan Cobbins. Gentlemen, how are we all? How are we doing, Mikey? Flying, Mikey. Yeah. Yeah, right. good, good stuff. Good, Best, sir. Good, good to see you all. That's all very civil. Yes. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> um, don't know how civil things will be this weekend. Croke Park is obviously a, 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 a cesspit <laughs> of violence and. Uh, aggression at the moment but there'll be none of that for the Harlan lads will they they're you know honest honest men leave it all out in the field um hopefully so it's a couple of big ones Saturday evening 5 30 Kilkenny v Clare and then on Sunday Limerick and Galway at 3 30 um so let's just get straight into the previews I guess um Derek Kilkenny and Clare um, there's obviously 30 players starting here and uh, 26 more that can come off the bench or however many or 22 more can come off the bench but it's very hard to get away from kind of the battle of the two managers here a lot of people notice similarities in Brian Lowe's kind of demeanour to, to Brian Cody they're both called Brian um, <laughs> they, um, but also just the, they were both I, fullbacks they were, they were both, both fullbacks, fullbacks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 uncompromising fullbacks but I don't think you get any <laughs> other kind of fullback yeah. But but Derek, I suppose they're also Brian Cody has proven himself as one of the great thinkers of hurling, obviously over an illustrious career. But Brian Lowen is also this season in particular, like I think people have been really impressed with what he's done with this Clare team, how he has been able to kind of change their approach from game to game, and I guess just how much he's getting out of them and how they've probably moved into the position of second favourites for the All Ireland. So the touchline battle here, I think, is one that a lot of people will be focusing on. Yeah, it's interesting, no doubt. And even, I suppose, when you see Rory Hayes being whipped off after eight minutes against Wexford, they're kind of thinking, I was actually thinking of, I don't remember Willie O'Dwyer being taken off after 16, I think, 17 minutes of an all earned final, I think, against Limerick. Or was it against yourselves, Brendan? I can't remember. I think it was against Limerick. Um, so, you know, even though you might you might or might not agree with that particular approach, like depending on, on the outcome, I suppose, there's definitely kind of similarities, there seems to be. Um, yeah, and look, for me... I think back to Brian's first year, like I think Waterford beat, beat Clare by 10 points in the first year of Brian's tenure. Oh, and down in Parky Cueve. Cork beat them last year and then there's there's obviously significant improvements uh, this year and everything seems to be aligned. Everything, everyone seems to be kind of working as one. All the speculation about, you know, how, how kind of relationships are with, with, with board, etc. seem to be just parked and at the heart of it, I think Conlon and, and, and Tony Kelly are, are driving that mantra. And of course, Cody is, is kind of uh, I suppose the, the Leinster team in general are probably living under the bubble of, of kind of not, you know, being playing second fiddle to Munster, which we would probably advocate, I suppose, generally here. And they have to creep into a third kind of Leinster championship winning kind of team. And it's perfectly set up for them, if you want me to be completely honest, ahead of Sunday or Saturday. It's, it's actually perfectly set up almost kind of like like 19 semi final, if you like, albeit. Limerick are not are clear are not all Ireland champions, so there's a different dynamic there. Yeah, per- perfectly set up, Brian. Would you would you agree here? Um, I suppose Clare kind of they had their hangover after the monster final against Wexford for about sixty minutes. We don't need to revisit the pain of that too much, but you know, in ten minutes they showed what they are capable of, and it was it was far far too much for Wexford in that ten minutes, like which is. Yeah, no, you can't really treat it in isolation because Wexford were obviously exhausted from all they had done to stop them for 65 minutes. But um, Wexford obviously beat Kilkenny down in Nolan Park um, and have been kind of a match for Kilkenny, you know, in the championship over the last kind of six, seven years. So kind of the form the form guy might say Kilkenny are the Leinster champions, but, but Clare are potentially coming into this match, you know, rightfully with some confidence that they, they know how to beat this Kilkenny side. Yeah, there's there's a bit of that in. I think it does. It suits Kilkenny. I think down to the ground the way the thing is now. I suppose to be a lot of talk around the Leinster Championship and that versus the Munster Championship, and we'll probably see this weekend um, with the two games as to where the standards are at with both. 
I think what impressed me most against Clare was when they got that purple patch, they made the most of it. And mo- the majority of teams in the past who got the purple patch, who get their purple patch against Kilkenny, don't make the most of it. We saw it against Galway, hit a lot of wides, and suddenly then TJ hits every free over the bar. And before you know it, you're five points down. So that's going to be the key, I think, for me, if Clare are going to win the game the weekend, get that period of dominance. Can they get Peter Duggan, Shane O'Donnell, Tony Kelly, all hitting the ball over the bar three, four in a row to get a bit of a two score away from away from Kilkenny at that point? Because if you don't, Kilkenny will suffocate you. As you see, it drains your confidence then as a group. You go in at half time. I've said it all the time about Kilkenny. You should be six points up. You're actually one point down. You're sitting at rest from scratching your head going, hey, lads, you better steady up here. And the very minute you say that out loud, it puts panic across everybody. And then you hit more <laughs> wides. So, but fair, I think, to be fair to them, have shown against Wexford. When it looked like Wexford were slipping away from them. Now, when Lee Chin got that goal, they could easily, easily have panicked, but they didn't. And also, I think the game is played slightly different in Crow Park than it is in Munster Championship. The field is bigger. It's that bit faster. It's a more unusual atmosphere up there because the crowd is that bit further away from you than you would have maybe in Turles. And uh, I think it will suit Clare's running game as well. Like Shane O'Donnell will have more grass to run into Peter Duggan. The distance between him and the uh, chase and back kick any half-back line will be greater. So that will give him more one-on-one opportunity with whoever he's marking inside, probably Hugh Lawler. But if he can slip across onto Mikey, who there's a size difference on, then I think Clare could make hay on that one as well. Yeah. Rory, it's it's fair to say the dimensions of, of Crow Park and the way it plays will probably suit Clare. But there's also we're getting away from after Nolan Park. There, there's nowhere in the country where Kilkenny are more at home than Crow Park. And their record, perhaps in All Ireland semi finals in the last couple of years, is not what it had been before. I think they'd only lost two up until the last couple of years ago, 2001, 2005. They've been an astonishing record in All Ireland semi finals. But it's still Crow Park. It's still like it's their second home yep. and um, somewhere where they, they, they know every blade of grass, don't they? Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's a that's a very good way of 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 describing it. It is a second home to them, um, and they like they would in terms of from a Clare perspective. I mean, when is the last time a lot of these guys? Some of them might even be playing in Croke Park for the very first time. Now they do have um, a lot of experience. They have more experience in the team. They have a lot of All Ireland medals. There's still a good chunk of the team still left over from 2013. A lot of these guys have won minor All Irelands in the Clare team. They've won under 20 All Irelands. They've got. Um, they've they've been in Fitzgibbon Cup finals. I know those games now aren't necessarily played in Croke Park, but. At the same time, there's an awful lot of experience in this Clare side. They're coming with really good momentum as well. I think the key thing for them in in relation to um, in relation to the quarter final specifically was to just get over that game because that's one match where they could have been caught. I think from Kilkenny's perspective, you mentioned it. The last two semi finals will definitely rankle with them to a certain degree. The fact that they lost. The fact that they lost by a, they lost the last of Waterford in that first semi final after being what eight points up at half time, mm. and then t- to get Cork into extra time, and then you know you would have felt maybe they would have had the opportunity to push on at that stage, and and instead Cork came out and kind of really blew them away in extra time. So I think there's, you know, there should be a good motivation levels across both teams. I think the extraordinary thing is is how few times and how seldom these two counties have actually met in the championship this is only their eighth meeting now i know claire were kind of trapped in munster for the best part of 60 70 years and obviously that didn't allow for more championship meetings between the two but i do think that's a very interesting aspect in that like we don't see kilkenny claire in the championship all that often and i think that does add another level of intrigue to saturday yeah um from a Tactical point of view, Derek, I think we mentioned it on here after the quarterfinals that it's kind of interesting how Wexford troubled Clare because Brian Cody, obviously, in recent years has taken a little bit of criticism for kind of maybe not not playing the more modern game, playing through the lines, kind of still kind of sticking to the traditional Kilkenny game of like kind of, you know, playing along, trusting your forwards to win the ball. He's, he has obviously kind of, you know, kind of uh, mixed things up a bit this year, but... For Wexford against Clare, what worked was playing the ball long, trusting your forwards to beat their man, and you know, 
No more than in the football se- uh, quarter final last weekend, a big high ball into the mixer was causing all sorts of trouble for Clare and Kilkenny have, without doubt, the personnel on that full forward line to make that work. Yeah, and I think they will, they will look to mix it. You're right, yeah. And, and what also worked, I suppose, was, was the, the position of the O'Keefe. But the dilemma there now is, I was thinking about this this morning. So if you're, if you're Mikey Butler and you're possibly going to be tasked with, with Kelly, right? Or if, if that's the, mm. based on what Cahill Mannion, you know, based on his tracking of Cahill Mannion, you're kind of thinking, right, you're looking at the Wexford game and you're saying Shane Reck did a really good job up to the point where he cramped up and he had to come off the field, if you like, right? So you're saying... Mikey Butler takes Kelly, tracks him everywhere. Now, does Kelly go to full forward then to make it? Or, you know, for, for a while, does he go to centre forward? And then you have a dilemma for Richie Reid then. Richie Reid has basically located himself. He hasn't followed his man down the pitch, and he's he's basically located himself with just on the 45 for most of the games thus far. So if Kelly goes to 11, it, it basically frees up Richie Reid. And then you're, you have a couple of things coming into the equation, and you probably have Richie Reid leaving off Davy Fitzgerald or leaving off Davy Reedy on the field with, with the likelihood. So planking himself as, as a plus one, if you like. So that, that really interesting thing for me, how that materialised on, on both sides. Will Mikey Carey match up with Shane O'Donnell? I'm just thinking of pace. Or does Shane O'Donnell then take himself into the full forward line, you know, for the first time this year, as opposed to the wing forward role he's playing? So I think they're the tactical things. But I think, you know, can Kenny have the artillery in terms of insight, but I wouldn't, if you're planning this week, you're going to say, right, what did Wexford do? With it? And, and they got joy out of it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll do that all the game or the whole game. Mm-hmm. You, know, you might kind of say, you might mix it up. So I do, I do think you will see TJ in there at times. You might even see Walter in there at times with a Twin Towers approach. But I don't think Kilkenny can be as predictable to say, right, Lee Chin and Connor McDonald work really well in there. Let's lump it in as fast as we can. Because I think, I think Claire will... Will, will adapt to that if you like and I think they're, they're the things that I'll be looking out for the potential matchup as I said between Mikey Butler and Tony Kelly and where Tony Kelly then takes him knowing that Butler is, is going to track him everywhere he goes and and as I said TJ maybe you might see TJ at, at 11 you might see him at, at 12 for different stages of the game you might even see him going in the corner on, on a potentially on a Rory Hayes if you like bringing Connor Cleary to the corner then you know so they're the things that will undoubtedly happen throughout the game and the other thing from a clear point of view I suppose is Mullen has been very hot from, from open play in terms of scoring points from distance, Adrian Mullen. And he's, he's kind of filtered between midfield and half forward. And he's, he's deceptively kind of, you know, cunning, I suppose, at, at just, just scoring from 75, 80 yards. And before you know it, he has four or five points from play from his, mm. uh, after, his, after his thing. But look, there's a, there's a definite pace disparity, I think, between the two teams. But I, think I read a really good article I read from Philly McMahon. Last week, where he said pace is only an issue when you're running into grass, and I think Kenny will make sure that the clear players are running into the body as opposed to running into grass. I thought <laughs> it was a really good point, you know. That's a fair one, Brendan. The um, uh, the, the it, it's always it, it's an issue before every clear game now is kind of the Tony Kelly um question, and it seems to be universally accepted that Mikey Butler will pick up. It's, it's interesting that you know. Mikey Butler's reward for being like one of the best defenders of the year is that for his, the biggest game of his career, probably I would imagine, like did this is his task, and um, we've seen well, varying fine. levels of success here. And and what, have there been any common denominators for you? on like, obviously, Rec had a very good game on him the last day for Wexford. Uh, did he do anything in particular, or was it just was it just pure hard work, diligence, staying in his pocket, and just kind of been on his toes or was there anything about his positioning or, or kind of how he approached it that was that was different or clever or was it purely just grunt work? I think it's, it's, a, it's a mindset if you're going out like it, it takes a certain character to to understand that you might not hit the ball all day but your job is to make sure that Tony Kelly doesn't hit the ball and it's so tempting in the game to go to the next fella coming against you rather than stand beside Tony Kelly but I think also looking at Tony Kelly's point of view, since Brendan Maher did the job on him above in Ennis today, I think Tony Kelly has learned a huge amount as a good hurling brain he has from that experience. That day he ended up back nearly in his own full back line for a lot of the game, thinking he might get away from Brendan there, but Brendan followed him. What he didn't do was, was take Brendan Maher to places he might be as comfortable, up corner forward, or playing as a corner back, we'll say with Tony playing the full forward line all that kind of stuff. And I think we'll see a lot more of that in Crow Park with the wide open spaces. Now, of course, if Mikey Butler decides he's going to follow, then you normally have to play with seven. 
uh, to give him give your defence structure. And uh, Richie Reid sits, so that means he's going to have to potentially he might have to mark somebody. And it's very hard to mark the modern centre forward when he's playing in his own half back line. So again, I think when the game pans out, it's going to be exactly the same as every other game. There'll be two inside the half forward lines will meet each other in the middle third of the pitch. The midfielders will try to tip the balance there, and whichever half back line has to come up to mark the spare man loses the match. And I think that's probably the way. I think when we get into that middle third, that's the way it's going to. That's the way it's going to pan out with Richie Richie trying to sit as much as he can over the course of the game. But if if Conlon can win the ball, break a tackle, march up the middle of the pitch and hand pass the ball to David Reedy and Kelly coming off his shoulder, there's not much Mikey Butler can do in that case then. And that's going to be when the head scratching starts on the Kilkenny side if they're not working hard enough to stop that from happening. Yeah, we we always say it, Rory, like the, the middle third is like it's it's where her matches are, are won and lost and it's kind of only been um, kind of more focused in the era of Limerick, shall we say. Um, Claire have been very good on that this year. Obviously, they've repositioned Shane O'Donnell. They've got very good half back line. Uh, their midfield has been excellent. Uh, the last time we had Jackie Tyrrell on here, he was kind of bemoaning perhaps that Kilkenny don't have that kind of gritty Michael Fennelly, you know, ball winning kind of midfielder. Did you see much from Fogarty and Kenny now in the in the win over Galway, which is since we last spoke to Jackie that that kind of suggested that they're they're improving in that area? Like the only thing is though, I mean, like there's still you had you had Fogarty, but Adrian Mullen was is Adrian Mullen still kind of the mainstay inside in that midfield as well? I would have mm. never have considered him a midfielder really. I always thought he was a sort of a sort of a half forward inside forward but doing a really good job there too but that's the nature of Kilkenny teams by and large I mean we mentioned this before Richie Reid was a sub goalkeeper on a panel going back five or six years ago he's now being converted into you know sort of a modern day centre back He like Brian like the way they can adapt and change and get the most out of what they have and find you know square pegs to go into those round holes is just typical Kilkenny it's the only thing that would have me a small bit uh, sort of skeptical about their ability to maybe take Claire on Saturday there has been a lot of chopping and changing there's been a lot of like if you go back to when they were in their pomp you know and that's a long time ago at this stage but you could nearly pick we could we could all pick the Kilkenny team in advance of Sunday or Saturday or whenever the match was there's no guarantee, like you, 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 you know, look, you kind of yeah. probably know 11 or 12, but there's yeah, but still will be... Walter Walsh be in, will Pork Walsh it? be Por- in, you Por- don't Por- know. Welsh, you know, and what positions are they going to play and where are they going to play and what position is TJ going to play? And, you know, um, so Key and Kenny, I think, started the last day, was taken off. Was it just on the stroke of half time or just afterwards? Mm. Like, so like there's an awful lot of, um, uncertainty I would say around selection which is very untypical of Kilkenny which I think you know adds another layer of um, confusion I'd say we'd say in terms of you know trying to figure out how these how these two teams are going to match up against each other whereas from a Clare perspective I think we pretty much know they're one to 15 as long as everybody's fit and I think there's been a consistency of selection all the way through and he's got serious weight in that middle eight that Claire that Kilkenny are going to find um Kilkenny will find it will find that a serious challenge on Saturday I would suggest like David Reedy uh and David well David Fitzgerald is probably a shoe in for an all-star already irregardless of what happens from here he's been one of the best midfielders in the country I would I'd suggest mm. so I think yeah I think they're going to be up against it there be very interesting to see how that plays out it sounds like you're calling Rory, for... Go on, Sorry, it's, it's just the case that when you talk about the, the, the change of the flux in the, in, the, in the Kilkenny team, I know Derek, you'd be interested, you do think of this as well. If you're an opposition manager and you're looking at Kilkenny, and I had it above in the press box with a few Kilkenny lads before they started the Leinster final. Well, how many changes? There's no change, I think. I'm not sure. Maybe. No one said anything. Do you know, It shows a tightness in the camp that the changes haven't gotten out, number yeah. one. And number yeah. two is if you're an opposition manager looking at it, you're going... I wonder actually what 15 he's going to put out. Will he ch- make three changes? Will he make no changes? And it makes it very difficult to prepare to face him then true. from a matchup yeah. point of view. 
But it, but, but yeah, that, yeah. It, that, that is true, Brendan, right? Just, sorry, Derek. Just the only yeah. thing is, though, is, is that by design or is that more by, is, has he been forced into this situation to have to chop and change? Like, d- d- does Brian Cody kind of uh, feel like the kind of manager that likes this level of, yeah. you know, uh, chopping and changing and constantly, you know, I, like I would have always got the impression he kind of likes a settled team. He likes the team to be settled. Uh, I think that, that you know? I think he's adapted, to be honest with you, to the modern okay. game. I think he's adapting to the, we're not giving him enough credit. Like years ago, they said, they don't use tactics. They don't use this. They don't use oh, that. No, well, that they was a load of rubbish. That was a load of rubbish. Yeah. I know, yeah. yeah. But like this is yeah. another layer of that, I think. It's, uh, it's, okay. it's him adapting to the modern game and the modern way people try to tactic their the way, the way around Kilkenny. Like Padre Walsh, I don't think is injured. But yet, you don't know if he's going to be starting, the sun, uh, starting or not. And he's, yeah. Derek, you'll know this. He's the first fellow you're looking at. If you're an opposition manager, how am I going to deal with Patrick Walsh at 11? What happens if he comes deep? The next thing he's not playing at 11. Well, I, thought Bl- I, thought, I thought Blanchfield was one of their best wing backs during yeah, the yeah, league, yeah. for instance. Yeah. And he hasn't gotten, a f- he hasn't really featured at all come championship. Connor yeah. Brown is nearly always brought in as a kind of a man mark in type scenario. Yeah. He, he, you know, you just don't know. It's a, D- it is a good point, actually. Derek, you know? you, you've, you've obviously faced him and, um, we watch it on the TV or from the stands would often see the kind of the little half smirk on Cody's face. And I, I, I do think there's a, there's a lot more, there's a lot more divilment to Brian Cody than perhaps he'd like to let on or that he doesn't care what he lets on or he doesn't let on. But did you, would you have found him a hard man to read? Yeah, a couple of things, I suppose. First of all, I think the, the two most cohesive teams are Clare and Limerick. And I think they're the, they're the teams that you, you can, so I'm going to make that point in, 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 Probably as a contradiction to, to maybe what maybe what Brendan is saying, contradiction, but just a, I, I do think that a counter helps. counterbalance to it. Yeah. Mm. It, it helps it helps the teams like they know who they have, they know their systems, they know how to play. So everyone can spring a surprise, and Brian is doing that. The unpredictability that can work too. So I'm probably I'm balancing what I'm saying by saying you know you go back to the Walter Welch being thrown into the All Ireland final a number of years. You go back to all those. I go back to 2016 semi final replay. I was managing myself, Waterford, here on Friday night that the midfield is going to be TJ Reid and Richie Hogan. We hear that Liam Blanchfield is going to be in the full forward and we hear that Mark Bergen is going to be in the full forward. Like, that materialises. Brian goes down to Marty Morrissey before the game. Any changes? No change. Next minute, <laughs> 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 the four boys are on. Next minute, the four boys are on the field, you know, and you're actually beating yourself up that you've been this honest, naive, gullible <laughs> manager before the match no, no in 2016. No changes, yeah. Six Given the given the truth, almost you know, and you're kind of you're kind of you're kind of beating yourself up over that. But we knew the change Friday night, so that again, the tightness at times, things can leak. Maybe it's the fact we're on the border here. We hear different things. We know a few fellas in Munkine, Steve Rue, fellas you went to school and say, and they give you the tip. You know that this is the team <laughs> on a Friday night. So so anyway, to, to make the point I'm trying to make, I suppose anecdotally there is a history of unpredictability, and I, I'm only speculating here, but I'm reading that. He actually nearly goes on training. You know, like I'm if I'm picking Kilkenny and I'm not in a, p- a position to pick Kilkenny, right? There's Parig Welch would be on my team. Mm. I just he'd be on my team, right? Because I need to put him on my team because he's one of our best players, right? No different than when Brendan's on the goal with tip, you have Parig Mar, you have Brendan Mar, you have Noel McGrath, you have Phyllis Lar- Lar- Lark Corbett, you have Phyllis, if they're right, they're playing no matter how they're going to train. I'm not sure does that apply. <laughs> To Brian, like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm watching Paulie Gwes get six points in play off, off Ty de Burke in the last round of the league. I'm watching him and I'm saying, Jesus, he's going to be a, he's going to be a main stalwart of Kilkenny for the, for the whole championship season. Now, I accept fellas' form can drop, but the balance between a fellas' form dropping and, and putting in the guy who's going in well in training as opposed to, it's like when you're having the bench over the years, you look to the bench and you say, right, hang on, you know, Austin Gleeson at 70% might be better watch than what you have at the bench at 100%. All those things are kind of weighed up, but, you know, who, who, who's to argue with? <laughs> you know, it's very... <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting caught in knots because I'm kind of... The yeah. argument is there, the three Leinsters are in the bloody cabinet, you know what I mean, yeah. the last three years. But, you know, when it comes up to knots, you kind of... I still think the more... Co- and I'm actually writing a bit on cohesiveness this yeah. morning. I was kind of saying to myself... I was reading a bit about the most cohesive teams over the years in soccer and rugby and Gaelic and, and, and American football are the teams where they, they know their systems play and the personnel are nearly the same a good bit all the way through. And, you know, I even listening to Ken Erpin interview last year in a rare interview, he was talking about, we won't, we'll actually 
what what will you do different? We'll actually just get better at doing the same thing. You know, slight tweaks, if you mm. like. And that's the count. Yeah, and I also think that um that that Brian Cody's rationale is what's the size of the fight in the dog. And I think that's what he looks at. And if a fellow's in training who loses the hurley and blocks a fellow down with his hands instead of going back for his hurley, that's the raw material that he wants. And I'm not saying Padraig Walsh doesn't fight enough. Like Derek said, we don't see what's happening inside in training. But I suppose he's the only manager that I know that could drop one of the main players or leave them off rather than dropping them. Won't be that harsh on him, but just leaving them out. And there's no row about it there's no murder about it the team just gets on with the job and wins the match like you know Derek if we left off Owen Kelly because he wasn't going that great in training the whole thing would probably fall asunder when we played on the Sunday because oh my god Owen's not playing you know so it's just that's that's good management as well that has to be recognised that, that, that's 25 years in the bank isn't it that's what that is um, we'll have to we'll have to call this one lads to get on to the next one so Rory you sound very confident of a Clare win was what I heard confident when it comes to <laughs> uh, when it comes to making any predictions in relation to Kilkenny I think uh, Fergal Horgan's reffing I think he'll facilitate a very open a very flowing and a very physical game I think that doesn't play into one team's hands over the other but I do I have been impressed with Clare's um, physical shape all the way through this campaign and I think they are coming with a bit more momentum I think there's a unity of spirit and purpose in that camp that I haven't seen for a long time they've got a spread of scorers now that Clare really haven't had in all their history they've always been nearly very dependent on one player and I know that might still be the case with Tony Kelly but like there's plenty of other lads now to pick up the the supporting the supporting cast and um I think Claire I think Claire to edge it but I wouldn't be surprised if extra time if we if we were in for a long day okay that's you say that about every game now that's just your no, line at this stage I, won't, I, I, I won't be saying it about Sunday's match okay fair <laughs> enough uh Derek Derek who you got who's gonna win yeah I think I think Rory's point around Fergal Hogan is well made I think that will help in the game in general. Um, yeah, I think the middle third, Brian Taylor, Tony Kelly, and um, David Fitzgerald, David Reedy. I think they'll eventually find a way to get in behind Kilkenny, you know. And I think I think they'll win really because of that. But again, um, I think it'll be it'll be tight. But I think just they have too much running ability in Crow Park and Meehan and Rogers off the bench later on to make yep. an impact. Too. And Shanahan, yeah, uh, and Brendan. Yeah, I just echo everything Derry said there about the getting in behind part. But the other thing I'd add is that the player players can release the ball very quickly before they just as they get to the tackle. So if Kilkenny goes swarm defence two, three on Shane O'Donnell, he'd have the ball out of his hands while they're wondering, we've got a hit on him, but then they'll go, Oh damn, the ball's gone. At that stage, someone's in around the back. So if you commit two, three bodies to the tackle, which Kilkenny do by instinct now, I don't think they can on they can step back from that. I think the speed of hand and the way that Clare can release the ball to runners coming off the shoulder would be enough, I think, to break the line of the offside trap and get them in to get a couple of goals they need to get over the line. Because certainly when Galway did that, they got in, but they didn't take the chances. I think Clare would put them away and that's why I give them the the uh, kiss of death by saying I think they'll jump the fence. Okay. Well, you're all wrong because Kilkenny are going to win. And uh, I know they've lost their last two semi-finals. But as listeners of this podcast know, I'm a beaten down Wexford Kerr and I will never back against Kilkenny because they're like the Terminator. And I can't, can't see him losing three All-Ireland semi-finals in a row. And just just because Brian Cody will have that half smirk on his face again. And we all need to see that. Um, moving on to Sunday. Um, if you want to hear something scary, uh, this is John Kiley talking about the four week break. Our injury list is very tidy at this stage, which means our sessions are probably the best they've been all season. Our lads are mentally fresh, physically fresh, and we have a very competitive group at the moment. Everybody is fighting for their place on the 26 or the 15. The lads coming back from injury increases that degree of competitiveness in the group, so that's a healthy thing to have. With the competitiveness of our group, the lack of game time isn't an issue. We have as much game time in-house as we would have outside, a more controlled environment where we can play as much or as little as we want. Jesus H. Christ, pray for Galway, is all I can say. <laughs> Jesus. Brendan. Um, John Kiley is he's not a man to set himself up for a fall. He's a very shrewd, shrewd man. So for him to actually be so open about how happy he is about things, it's not smoke and mirrors. Limerick must be absolutely tearing up trees and training, which is a terrifying thought. 
Yeah, they are. But when they when they go out, there's only 15 of them obviously can come out against Galway. And it's a knockout match. And we've seen in the last number of years, Limerick have probably, our last year where Waterford were that bit fatigued, I would say, when they played them. But for the first 10, 15 minutes, while Waterford had the fizz in them, they gave, they gave Limerick enough of it. That Galway as well, I suppose what you're, if you're a Galway supporter going down the road to Crow Park, you're relying on the fact that on any given day, we, we are good enough to beat anybody. And you're hoping that that will be their given day. But it's a hope. And uh, when we talked earlier about the cohesiveness of teams and the way they want to play and all, Limerick are probably the clearest in the championship of the last number of years of what they want to do. So therefore, you wouldn't expect them to panic. I don't think anyone would say that Galway will win the match uh, at all, I think. But that could be the key for Galway actually getting very close. But I don't see Limerick doing complacency. I also think that in 2019, when they Kilkenny beat them, I think it was one of the best lessons that Limerick ever, ever got. And I would still think to this day that memory is still embedded in their heads that we got caught and we're too good to get caught. And I think Kylie has given ownership to the players now and it's a great position to be in, I think, as a manager, that you have a group that drives itself, drives its own values and behaviours. I think Limerick have, have gotten to that point with the composure, I suppose, and the and the hurt that they carried from 19 when they when they didn't... Uh, when they let Kilkenny get too far away from him, thinking they could come back, and it just didn't happen. Yeah. The damage was done the first kind of 20 minutes, wasn't it, Brendan? I think it was like 1-7 to a point after. And they still nearly got it. They still nearly got, got the game back. Like, you know? Yeah, but they should have, yeah, let's they, be they honest, had to dredge it up. But, the, the, yeah. the first 10 minutes. but they, I think the way they, they behaved in the last 10 minutes of that match was very on limerick like Well, it was a, there's a more maturity now to Limerick in that they don't get frantic. I think that last 10 minutes of that All-Ireland semi-final, it got frantic. And you have to learn. You have to make mistakes in order to learn. I think they've learned a huge amount from that mistake. Yeah, and Derek, if, they, if they're if they looking for more lessons, they'll have found them the last day out in the Munster final, obviously, when you know they had to, they had to dig deep into those reserves of experience now. And I suppose confidence in, as you said, you know, the cohesiveness of the team and the continuity that they have that they, you know, they, it's a cliche, but they, they stuck to the process and that was enough. But I guess on the flip side, Henry Sheffield will watch that monster final a few times now and, and had a look at what Claire did, how Claire got so close to them. And it's just whether he can, you know, he can fashion a game plan from that. And also Rise's team who have been, you know, who were unusually flat in, in, in the Leinster final. There's no getting away from that. Yeah, and given the mental and, and against physical Claire. resolve, and against Cork, sorry. Yeah. yeah, and given the mental and physical resolve that Limerick had to show, it's probably an ideal scenario in, in terms of the four weeks, like a week. You know, I think the preparation. That's why. And look, in fairness, you know what's refreshing is well? it's refreshing actually to see a man be upbeat as well. You know, you know, and not be kind of playing mm. down the opposition. I know people might read that as as you know, maybe overly positive and overly confident, etc. But you know. I think it's refreshing. I see that with Dara Egan. I saw it a lot with Dara Egan this year after the best meet. And I saw it with Sheedy over the years. You know, when you're just, as an ex-manager or a manager, you're trying to look and to learn from the best fellas in the game. And you're kind of looking at what message is he trying to send out in general? And I, I thought that was interesting to see Coyley like that. So, yeah, look, I think it's an ideal preparation uh, period for Limerick. Obviously, when we, when we go on Friday night and you go onto Limerick GA Twitter and you want to see, the first thing you look for is you look for 11 to see his lynch back. Mm -hmm. you, look, you look for Casey, either 15 or on the panel. These are things that are probably, you know, occupying my mind ahead of, of the game. In the terms of the Galway perspective, I think the general team, general narrative after the Galway Cork game has been Cork threw away, threw away that game, Cork threw away that game, Cork, you know, had, had all the play left. And I think that's playing into Galway's hands in terms of many people are using the words kind of free hit Many people are using it. So I, I actually expect Galway to play really well and not win, if that if that makes sense. I think, you know, I think I think they'll I think they will play well, you know, and, and I'll be interested tactically to see will they not they follow the template of Shane O'Neill a couple of years ago where they act, occupied that channel in front of Aaron Galan, you know, that area. I don't know, Ronan Ma did it before successfully in in the first half of the Munster final last year. Just hanging around that kind of left corner back area between left half back and left corner back. So They'll be the interesting things for me, but in many ways, I think I don't think Galway will be as flat. They can't be as flat because they'll be blown away if they are as flat. And and um, I don't think they will be. And I think the I think Galway will actually play well because sometimes when it's 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 play it's 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 played down to, to an extent where you feel you have no chance. 
I'd expect Henry and, and Richie O'Neill and the boys are hugely motivated with, with, with meeting Limerick head on physically up there. You know, and I think that's what will happen. I don't think it'll be enough. Uh, Rory, um, we've mentioned it here before, the kind of the, the whack-a-mole element of where the Limerick scores will come from. Um, obviously, Dermot Burns was quiet against Clare and, um, you know, Aaron Glenn didn't have his... He was good, but like by Aaron Glenn's standards, he, was, he wasn't fantastic. But Seamus Flanagan comes up with eight points and, you know, Derek makes the point. Kyle Hayes is fit. He's going to come back into that team, you'd imagine. And if they have Peter Casey primed to come off the bench, it's... It's and just Kane a terrifying Lynch, prospect. Kane Lynch, yeah. Lynch will probably be fit enough, certainly, to make the 26, you would imagine. And it is. It's just it, There's just way too many fires for Galway to have to put out. That's the biggest problem. And I think Derek is spot on as well. I, I'd expect Galway to play well. There's a mercurial nature to Galway hurling back through all back through history there where they can come with performances when you least traditionally this is when their championship started and all that yeah well, that, 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 that is true but I mean like I always think back to the 2005 semi-final where they were not given a prayer against a Kilkenny team that was just beginning to start to gather momentum now I know it's obviously 17 years ago has no relevance but it does kind of feed into the sort of history around Galway Hurling in that when they're kind of Bro- when they're coming into a game completely written off given absolutely zero chance they're, they're a good side like I mean there's a lot of these fellas that were in All-Ireland Finals not so long ago they've run Limerick close on any chances they've actually met whether it's league or championship beat them earlier on in the league in a game that I thought both teams went at it reasonably uh, competitively given the nature of how the league played out that was one game we felt where the two teams did kind of go at it and the health, the health warnings are quite as strong on that one but yeah <laughs> you know so like there are certain little things and I think I think Derek again is spot on like the narrative was that Cork blew it I think that's a really good position for Galway to be coming into this game and I do agree as well I, I couldn't disagree with any of it that I think they'll play well but won't win yeah um brendan i i'd have to ask you because i think they've been the most impressive uh, goalkeepers in, in, in the championship thus far um there's no surprise in nicky quaid he's like somewhat understated become like one of the most important players on the limerick team and not that he's taken for granted but his you know his kind of consistent excellence means that he doesn't you know he's never mentioned his man of the match or anything like that but you goalkeepers never are, huh? Um, but Aina Murphy, I think... I, has... By the way, by the way, I actually did, and I suggested this to our panel on the day. I thought Aina Murphy was man of the match against Cork. I thought he was absolutely mm. outstanding. And it's a really good battle, actually, between yeah. two goalkeepers he is, on Sunday. He sorry, has, sorry. He's been, a, just to say, Brendan, he has, Aina Murphy has been a bit of a revelation this year. And not that it's been a problem position for Galway. Probably the problem was they had a couple of outstanding candidates and they could maybe didn't always settle on one, but... He does. He does. Seems like the kind of the perfect modern goalkeeper, and like he's he is very important to Galway. He is, and I think also he's he's learned. What I like about Ian Murphy is when they played Galway or they played Limerick the year the the, the last when there was ten minutes of added time in that game. I think because Limerick scored three points from misfires on puck outs, but he still went for it, and then it hadn't affected his game after that. He's still going 50, 60 yards. We'll say he's going thirty yards on puck outs. Um, but it's going to be pressure on him now on, on on Sunday. And if he can get the ball away to his five or seven, when whoever the two wing forwards are, probably Morrissey and uh, Hegarty, are sitting back to protect their half-back line. If he can get the ball away to them, that pulls the Limerick half-forward line back closer to the Galway goals on the puck out, so it exposes one-on-one for, the half, for their own half-forward line. So that is going to be the, the real game of chess. And it'll really test his, his metal, but I think he's really learned from that experience he had a number of years ago. And he certainly has emerged as, as, as a key part, I suppose, to what Galway are, are trying to achieve. And of course, the other side, Nicky Quaid, I mean, like the most unassuming goalkeeper, like he plays like a full back nearly for all the world, doesn't do everything in mad spectacular. Um, but at the same time, he's really, really solid. And you know, when the ball goes in under the crossbar, he's going to catch it. He's going to hit the right puck out. He knows the signals and the, the full back line absolutely back him. He's the real, real modern goalkeeper. And um, because Murphy has been playing so well in Kilkenny, as men probably the Quail hasn't gotten a number of more all-stars that he might have felt that he should have gotten. But uh, that's just the way it goes in, in the goalie side. There's, 
there's three picks you can't play him corner yeah. forward and that's the other side of the odds stars we'll talk about <laughs> later in the year maybe but no both yeah. of them are really really good in fact yeah. what their county are trying to do Sorry, Roy, before we get predictions here, just cu- curious, did Davy Fitz not go for the idea of giving Aidan Murphy? Did the, did the no. goalkeeper's union didn't stand up there, no? No, 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 they just... Ah, look, I suppose maybe they felt a couple of the saves weren't as spectacular as maybe they look, but I thought his distribution was top class as well, and I think he's had a... As Brendan said, like, then there was a couple of other situations where he's had a couple of dodgy moments as well, and I think he's come through it all. And he's still very young, like, in goalkeeper terms... So I, you know, I think he solved a good position for them there, um, and they've got some puck out options if they do want to go along as well. They've got plenty of lads in, you know, between the Manions and like, they're like big they, fellas. They are big lads, like so they'll be able to mix it on that front with 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 Limerick. But I, I, I think ultimately, our God, we're going to rack up a big enough score and take the goal chances that they get. No, in fairness, they did it the last day. But, you know, they're probably going to need two or three goals and they make don't cough up many of them. OK, rather than asking you all for predictions, I'm going to say, Derek, w- w- what can Galway do here to win this game? But w- w- What's their chance? What's their shot here? Uh, well, listen, without being disparaging, it's, it's, a, it's not a shot in the dark, definitely not now. So that's, that's, that's I, I'm going to repeat what I said. Like, I think I expect them to play well. I expect them to... Uh, not not do a huge amount different from the Cork game in terms of their setup, like four half forwards, two in the full forward. I mean, Cahill Mannion maybe not following one of the, or not Cahill Mannion, Porig Mannion not following um, his wing forward and, and handed him over almost to the wing forward on the op- opposition team. And, uh, you know, wing forwards, marking wing forwards and him tucking in, if you like, back in the full battling to give some a bit of protection there. I think Finn and Burke will match up with Groot Hegarty like they did in the league game. I think you know Gerard McInerney will perhaps match up with with um, with Morrissey. You know, you know. So I think they'll be they'll have their matchups in there, and they might leave. They, I, I'd imagine they'll be leaving one of our midfielders to keep an eye on Keane Lynch if he's if he's picked at eleven, which I actually expect. I I think Kylie will 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 react to the training as well. I think he'll pick one of the two boys. I don't think that you know. I think one of the two will play from the start. You know, and I I don't know that, but that's just my gut feel is that one of the two will play. And um, so. What kind of answer? What do they need to do? I think they need to be very, very well structured as they they have been. You know, they set up to, to, to stop Cork's running game. They succeeded to a point, albeit Cork had goal scoring chances. But I, I do think you'll see a really aggress- aggressive Galway approach and it will be successful enough to not win the match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. <laughs> By the way, just, if I was Henry Sheff, I just put this podcast before the match, just when they're finished the chicken and pasta and say, look at the world DC lad. And that could be a driving force for the for the Galway lads. You know yourself, Derek, there's nothing better than the cause and they've written off as much as they have been written off yeah. based yeah. on the warm-ups they have with Dahi Bork and McInerney and those lads. If they can get a big spin out of those two down the spine of that defence, and if they're knocking Limerick lads coming out with the ball and they can keep doing it for 73, 74 minutes, like that's and and based on these conversations, that should be enough to fire them up to be. And, able and to I do think, that. I think they will do that, Brendan. I think you will see a very fired up, top of the game Galway team. Mm. I just don't think it'll be enough to take down this Limerick team because yeah. I think, yeah. I think, they're, I think Limerick are build, building nicely, you know, and I yeah. think they're, they're going to get better at semi final and final. If we're if we're, if we're pinning podcasts to dressing room walls and talking about two thousand and five, um, I think uh, we're clutching. That, our way of saying we all think Limerick are going to win. Um, but we'll find out. We'll find out on Sunday on RTE two and RTE Radio one, and also the other match, the first match, Claire and uh, Kilkenny is also on RTE two and RTE Radio one, and we'll have live blogs, reports, reaction, everything else on the RTE website and the RTE News app. So we'll chat to you on Monday. So that just means we'll say goodbye to Derek and to Brendan and to Rory, and uh, we'll catch you all again on Monday. Thanks very much. Goodbye. We've earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! 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 He hits